There is a lot of research into how people learn. Thousands of journals and institutions are dedicated to studying it, and every year a quarter million new grads get masters in education. We know how people learn, so how do we end up with this? Turns out that when we try to apply that precious knowledge to e-learning, we run into some very real obstacles. So in this video, we're going to look into why it's so hard to apply that knowledge to e-learning specifically and how to fix that. We're going through the most popular ID models out there, and for each one, you'll get some real-world practical tactics to help you apply them to your e-learning so that you can harness all that powerful science to make training that learners can't get enough of and that actually transforms behavior. My name is Mary Jo, and this channel is for instructional designers who really want to make e-learning that stands out. So let's dive in. Let's start with the obstacles. Think back to when e-learning got its start in 1999. The possibilities blew everyone's mind. It was going to let us train people faster, at scale, without the travel, logistics, and cost of in-person training. It was going to change everything. But somewhere between then and now, we took a wrong turn. We kept optimizing for that speed and efficiency until we finally got to the pinnacle, the fastest and cheapest way to create an online course content dump, then quiz. To be honest, this is the quickest way to make and deliver courses, but the actual learning got optimized right out of it. Unfortunately, this kind of became the standard, so when you say e-learning to most people today, this is what they think of. No wonder they hate it. It gets worse. Because this is called e-learning, we put instructional designers in charge of making this stuff. People who know how learning works, they've studied the learning models, so they're in a unique position to know that this sucks at teaching. It's frustrating, it's demoralizing, and it happens because this is the expected result, so everything, templates, processes, timelines, volumes of content, everything is set up to lead to this. So bad e-learning survives to this day for two reasons. One, because its goal is often to check a compliance box as quickly and as cheaply as possible. And two, because theory isn't practice. It's not always immediately obvious how to take this theory and translate it into concrete actions when you're building a course. So our courses don't apply what we know about human learning. But you know who does apply all that science of human learning? game designers. And you know why they do it when we often don't? Because unlike bad e-learning, bad games die. Bad e-learning keeps rising again, pun intended, bad games stay dead. Nobody has to play a game to check a compliance box, so if everyone hates a game, they don't make another one like it. Games have to help the player actually upskill while they're having fun, Otherwise, the game is a failure. So game designers borrow extensively from those evidence-based models and they found ways to make them actionable because they had to. So when we gamify our training, we're not really taking games, we're taking back our science of learning back from the world of games, but in a new and improved and actionable way. And we're just applying it to its original intended context, learning. Now let's look at the instructional design models and let's see how games have made them actionable so that we can easily use them. And we're gonna start with one of my favorites, Kathy Moore's action mapping. I love this model because it ruthlessly cuts the fluff out of training. But the best thing about it is that it sees training as a way to solve a real world problem. Whenever I hear a designer say, is training even the solution here? I know this person is starting with the actual problem, not with the brick of content they've been asked to squeeze into a course. You cannot create effective gamified training or even non-gamified training unless you answer three questions straight out of action mapping. What measurable outcome do we wanna see in the world? What do learners need to do for that outcome to happen? And why aren't they doing it already? The core of good gamification is cognitive mechanics, meaning you take the desired behaviors and you turn them into a series of challenges for the learner. The first two questions, what's the measurable outcome and what actions do we need, they help you figure out what the desired behaviors are. That's a good start, but we still need one more ingredient. Let's say you're teaching someone how to deliver employee feedback. Anyone can learn the hamburger method to do that. Praise, constructive feedback, praise. But it's a whole nother ballgame when you're sitting in front of a hostile employee. The real challenge isn't to memorize the method, it's in building the reflexes to keep your cool and really apply it in that real world context. That's why we need to ask, why aren't they doing it right now? Is it time? Is it stress? Is it social pressure? Is it doubt? Is it not knowing how? 
Whatever it is, we have to bake those obstacles into the challenges so that learners build the skill under realistic conditions. In gamification, the final challenge is what they need to do in real life, and everything leading up to that is designed to help them prepare for that final challenge. No fluff. So if you're a fan of action mapping, you're already thinking a little bit like a game designer. The next model is also focused on real world impact and it is Kirkpatrick's four levels model. This one looks at the effectiveness of training in four ways. One, did they like the training? Two, did they retain the knowledge? Three, did they apply it on the job? And four, did it drive real world outcomes? A lot of the time people gamify their training in order to improve the first metric, enjoyment. So lots of gamification out there is basically a standard e-learning course that someone slapped some badges or an avatar onto, but that's not gonna help anyone learn more. It's not effective gamification. I've said it before, if you really wanna leverage how games teach, you start with a real world outcome and you build everything to aim at that. So we start with level four. Now, turning your content into challenges means that you're not lecturing the learner. You're making them overcome increasingly difficult problems. And because they're the ones figuring things out actively, that makes it more memorable. That's level two. You're also integrating the real world obstacles that make this difficult so you can be sure that they can overcome them in real life and apply it on the job. That's level three. As for level one, enjoyment, you don't need to do anything special. Give learners a relevant, well-balanced problem to solve and it's easy for them to engage because you've given them something to do. Enjoyment emerges naturally out of feeling clever for solving relevant problems so you don't need to add anything special just for engagement's sake. So that's Kirkpatrick. Now remember a couple weeks ago when I talked about how the brain only has limited working memory and if you overload that, learning can't happen? Well, cognitive load theory goes a lot further than that and it divides the cognitive load into three types. First, intrinsic load. That's the complexity of the content itself. You can't get around that. There is some mental work that goes into learning something. So this is the relevant mental work. One of the ways gamification keeps that load under control is by making learners have to demonstrate true mastery at every step before they move on. If you're not understanding this first step, we're not letting you zombie click through everything and just keep piling on more until your head explodes. Instead, if you're struggling, games use tactics like opt-in hints and dynamic difficulty to help you figure things out for yourself. So that keeps the cognitive load at just the right level for every single person, every step of the way. The second type of load is extraneous load. That's the useless extra load that comes from the course itself and how the content is presented. Think useless written instructions and all the irrelevant content that you have to include because you lost the argument. It happens to all of us. But this extra load drains the learner's mental battery without bringing them any closer to the learning objective. I've just made a whole video about how to use game mechanics to keep that stuff out of the learner's limited working memory and I'll link that below. And the third type is germane load. Not that germane. Germane load is a mental effort that's needed to move the content from working memory to long-term memory so that it becomes automatic. Oftentimes that's a matter of practice. Games are uniquely good at managing this because they're built on repeating loops with slight differences each time. So that gives the brain the chance to practice differently, which is exactly what builds mastery. Next up we have SAM, the successive approximation model. This is more of a production methodology, but I want to mention it because it's way more effective than Addy. In the traditional Addy way of developing e-learning, you analyze the needs, you design the training, and then before you move on, you communicate with the client, usually through a leaderboard. And a lot of iteration happens here on paper before you build. Sounds smart, but the problem is, clients don't always carefully read design docs, and even if they do, you're asking them to imagine what you've got in mind. And sometimes when they finally get a playable in their hands, it's not what they imagined, but now they've approved the storyboard, so it's a bit too late, and and they're not happy and you're a bit screwed. Now the SAM is about getting something playable quickly and iterating and getting feedback on that instead of iterating on documents. Good training games are also built like that because engagement, fun, and aha moments are not things that you can easily convey through documents. It's something your client has to experience. Besides, if you're trying to storyboard something that can go in a whole bunch of different directions based on player choices or abilities, a linear medium like a storyboard is gonna struggle to convey those choices. By putting something in the client's hands immediately, everyone's on the same page, even though there's no pages, and there's a shared experience and we're all talking about the same thing. Okay, and this final one is one I had never even heard of before, to be honest, but so many people commented that effective gamification reminds them of the ARCS model of motivation that I had to look it up. 
ARCS stands for Attention, Relevance, Confidence, Satisfaction. This model says you need to hook learner attention right away. And games give you a ton of ways of doing this, but just to name a few, there's making sure that the learner is active right from the start, not having to go through a lot of instructions, using uncertainty of outcome to get that focus, and making sure that the challenge is at just the right level so that they have to pay attention. Relevance is the key to effective gamification because real engagement comes from people seeing themselves getting better at something that matters. So if you add a time-consuming mechanic that's not relevant just for the fun of it, that's the definition of a gimmick and it's probably going to turn your learners off. If your learners want pure fun and no relevance, they're not going to go to e-learning for that, okay? They have other options. Confidence is making a learner believe that they can succeed. A well-gamified program is constantly adjusting levels dynamically so that every challenge is keeping each learner in that Goldilocks zone of engagement. And another thing games are great at is showing us clear goals and where we stand in relation to them and celebrating every bit of progress. And finally, satisfaction comes out of these other ingredients. The aha moments, the fact that you're feeling smart for overcoming a demanding challenge. Those meaningful achievements are their own reward. So if you're wondering how to motivate learners, you can skip the rewards and skip the bells and whistles because when you do this right, the motivation is built right in. So great gamification doesn't compete with instructional design models. It's what brings them to life. It's how you take everything you already know about how people learn and you operationalize it. And if you're stuck in click next hell and you want a proven methodology to build great gamified training, just book a free call at the link below. We'll talk about your challenges and figure out a game plan to help you reach your goals. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. <laughs>